Hey guys, welcome to the Hacked Existence tutorial on installing a mod chip on the Nintendo GameCube. So by the end of this video, I'll show you guys how to install this Xeno chip that I got off of Amazon for about eight bucks onto the Nintendo GameCube. And what that's going to allow you to do is play backups of your original discs. Um, it'll also allow you to run unsigned code, which means you can play homebrew games and apps. Uh, so the Xeno chip is pretty neat. This is the first time I've ever done a wireless chip. Basically, you don't solder this on using wires. We stick this board right up against another board and solder right through those holes. So let's go ahead and jump in. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is make sure we don't have any game discs in here. And now we're gonna flip it over and we're gonna take out the four game bits that are in the four corners. We're gonna use this game bit that I got off of Amazon. This is a four and a half millimeter game bit and some proprietary screws that are in the corner. It's the same game bit that the Sega Game Gear uses. So let's get those screws out of there. All right, now we'll just lift the cover right off. And I'm going to go outside and blow this out with some canned air. All right, now this is all cleaned off. Um, we're gonna pop out this front plate here. So you gotta be really careful with the plastic pieces here. I'm just gonna unclip these two clips enough to lean this forward and kind of set it right there. Um, now we'll take out four screws and these two metal pieces will come right out. All right, now we're gonna remove one, two, three, four, five, six, seven screws. All right, we'll lift up the little power distribution board and kind of slide it back. And then do the same thing with this rear piece here. Pops right out. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six more screws to take off, seven. There's another one over here. Um, and we'll just leave this board connected the way that it is. All right, now from the base here, I'm gonna lift this whole piece off and there's a plug here that'll have to come unplugged when we lift and now I'm gonna go blow this out with some more canned air. All right, so now we're gonna be working with the disc drive here and the next step is to take the six screws out the bottom of this metal plate so that we can take this metal plate off. All right, so now this board is ready for our mod chip. All right, so this Xeno mod chip here has six different solder points. You can see two of them are these circles here. These two are two separate points, and these two here are two separate points. So you'll have to solder uh, each side of these holes without bridging the gap here. If you solder these two together, your mod chip's not gonna work. So on the back of the drive here, um, you can see there's this little hole here, and this little guy is gonna go right through that hole, and this is gonna line up here. So let me zoom in. So you can see it's gonna go about there. So these two bent edges on this printout here are gonna go through those two holes, about like that. These two contact points here are gonna to solder to these two dots on the board here. Down here, we're gonna solder this one to uh, that trace underneath, and this guy's gonna to go to the hole here. So what I'm gonna do is use some electrical tape to tape this chip into place. About right there looks pretty solid. All right, now we'll solder through those holes. All right, so there's a couple ways to do what we just did here. Uh, I like this wireless approach. I've never soldered a board straight to another board like this before. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, a lot of people on the internet will actually solder wires to these connection points and then solder the wires onto the board. You can do that as well. A lot of people use flux. Um, I didn't, I just use a rosin core solder. That seems to do the job. Um, so now I can take this tape off here. And you'll see on the board is two LEDs. Uh, if you plug this in and your LEDs don't get power, it's probably these two up here. The first time I soldered one of these chips on, I didn't solder all the way through. Uh, the solder gets suspended in those holes. So you really gotta drive a bunch of solder into those two points uh, to get power onto the board. So let's plug this thing in and take a look at it. All right, so now I'm gonna take uh, these two receivers here on the bottom of the CD drive. We're gonna match them up to these two points here. Then I'm just gonna give it a push right here to plug that plug back onto the motherboard. 
Now we're plugged in. I'm gonna take a Mario Kart Double Dash official game disc and stick that on there. I'm gonna plug in the video out and the power and I'm gonna hold these switches while I turn on the power. We're gonna see if it'll still play an original game disc. Now there is a laser in here that is normally covered by the shroud. Uh, so if you're worried about that, you should definitely wear some eye protection, but let's switch over to the video feed coming out of the GameCube. All right, so now we'll fire this up. And we'll see that our original game disc loads up just fine. So now what we need to do is check the LEDs on the mod chip. Okay, so looking at the mod chip as we power on the GameCube, we'll see the LED on the left come on, it'll do a flash, and then the LED on the right comes on. So basically this is exactly what we wanna see. If the one on the left is coming on, that means we've got power. Once it switches over to the one on the right, that means the injection has happened successfully. So if you're not seeing this LED pattern on your mod chip, uh, something is wrong with your solder job, you need to check that back out again. Okay, so now that we know that our GameCube is reading original game discs and we know that the mod chip is powered on and injecting, let's switch this out with a backup of the same disc. And this isn't going to work, but let's take a look at what happens. So different generations of the GameCube handle this differently. This one will just keep trying to read until it eventually times out and drops back to the dashboard. Older generations of the GameCube actually give an error and tell you something's wrong and to read the manual. Uh, and basically the reason that it's not going to read this disc yet is because we have to do the pot adjustment. So let's cut the power. I'm going to unplug it. We'll take the disc out. We'll lift this drive off and we'll adjust the potentiometer. Okay, so before we do the pot adjustment on the drive, we need to understand what the pot adjustment does. So pot stands for potentiometer. Basically, this is the equivalent of a dimming light switch, right? It's a variable resistor. So it's a resistor that sits between the power supply and the diode in the disk drive and allows you to adjust the level of resistance. Basically, it makes the laser brighter or dimmer. The reason we need to adjust it is because if you look at an original game disc versus a DVD-R backup of that same game, you'll notice that the original disc is extremely shiny and very easy to see, where the backup DVD-R is quite a bit darker. So we need to increase the power of the laser so that it can read this darker surface. Okay, so on the bottom of the drive here, this little dial is the potentiometer. Basically, moving it counterclockwise is going to reduce the resistance. Now, the problem with just guessing at where you're at is that if you turn the resistance down too low you're basically turning that laser up really bright and you could pop it uh, every time that you turn this potentiometer counterclockwise you're basically reducing the longevity of the laser's life so our goal here is to turn this counterclockwise just past the threshold where it has enough power to read a dvdr and that's it any further and we're taking time off the life of the diode so what we can do is start by reading the amount of resistance across the potentiometer we do that with the multimeter I've got mine set on 20k ohms of resistance um, for some reason my multimeter will not read on just regular ohms um, and that's probably because it's about as old as the GameCube but I found on 20k ohms I can get a reading so let's take a look we'll stick the negative side on the terminal here and the positive here and there we can see we've got about 0.34 kilo ohms of resistance, uh, which is basically about 340 ohms. So now what I'll do is take the screwdriver and just barely turn this down. I'm going to turn it like a sixteenth of a turn, uh, just down a little bit. And now we'll measure the resistance again. All right, now we're at about 240 ohms. So now I'm going to try that and see if that works. And I'm just going to keep repeating that process until I cross that threshold where the laser has enough power to read a DVD-R. All right, so this GameCube seems to be pretty happy reading the DVD-Rs right around 140 ohms of resistance. Uh, so another thing to note is that if your drive, once you find that threshold and cross it, if your drive is really noisy, it clicks and makes a lot of noise, um, you can also turn the dial slightly counterclockwise just a hair 
to make it just a little bit brighter to make that laser easier to read. All right, now that we're able to boot backups, I'm gonna put this all back together. All right, so at this point, we have a GameCube that's capable of playing DVD-R backups of our original game discs. Hopefully you guys are at the same stage now with your Xeno mod chip. Um, 150 ohms seems to be about the threshold for where the potentiometer wants to read DVD-Rs. So 140 ohms seems to be about a good setting for that potentiometer. Um, so in addition to playing DVD backups, we can now also load homebrew games. Uh, so in the next video, we'll take a look at Swiss and what we can do with that. It's open source and available on GitHub. So as always, stay tuned and thanks for watching.